everyone, and welcome to Two Times Miss Universe and Olympia competitor John Torelli's Broadway Gym and the first instalment of Torelli TV, which is going to be made available on a new YouTube channel, Torelli TV. So as you're aware on Facebook, we put out there that John Torelli is going to answer any and all questions you guys post up. And we've been absolutely influxed with questions, so we're not going to be able to get to all of them today, but we're going to answer as many as we can for you. So we're going to get started right away. How are you going today, John? Good, how are you? How are you feeling about answering any and all questions? Hey, look, um, I'm fine with it. You know, uh, it's, people need to know this sort of stuff. I'm the person who's got the information at the moment, so happy to share it. So just so you know, John has no idea really what these questions are. He's going to be shooting from here for a little bit today. Um, so just before we get started in the questioning, um, a lot of the American fans are going to be looking at this and watching this on basically from the New York base as well, and they've got no idea what they've been doing the last 10, 15 years. So what's been happening? What projects are you working on? I've been a gym owner and now I've started uh, Torelli Nutrition. I want to expand both of those businesses. And uh, as we've been talking about also a, a training course for personal trainers and, and people in general because there's just so much misinformation out there, especially on the internet. Um, you know, in my day, sorry, in my day, if you were getting information, you'd, you'd be getting it from an expert who either competed or had um, some sort of an authority. These days, you're getting information from people on the internet who actually aren't qualified to be giving that sort of information. And I've noticed, because I know my bodybuilding history, they're getting a bit of this from this person, a bit of that from somebody else. They're compiling it together and actually feeding you shit, from what I can see. Yeah. And, um, and, it's, uh, it's, and the courses aren't much better. The PT courses well, are a bit of a, a bit of a laugh as well. You're a, you've been through a personal training course. Yes. Um, what did you learn? And then what was what was the difference? Let me ask you this question: What was the difference? Look, Once you walked into a place like this, the, the information was basically useless to tell you the truth. They taught us a couple of exercises. It was basically written by insurance companies, so that you know, realistically, insurance providers were happy to insure PTs. And there was no real knowledge. Um, and, and looking at it from a whole, to actually teach what, what someone like you knows, it would be a two, three year course, you can think of a degree in PT, not a cert four. Um, so I think the whole whole thing is they just want to punch up PTs. If you this, this course, you're looking to get money, who would be best for a PT? But anyone do it. I think anyone can do it. Um, There's more structure for PTs. Well, it's, for me, I'm structuring it because I want something that that I know actually works. I want something that, that's been tried and tested, not just on myself, but from my predecessors. Uh, when I got involved in bodybuilding, the, 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 probably the, the biggest project that I set out for myself is to learn the history of bodybuilding, where everything came from. I was buying magazines. I found magazines that went back to um, the, the, the century prior. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had magazines that um, from the 1920s, 1930s, uh, so you know, and all that sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I really went back as far as I could to see how everything evolved and um, you know what's out today simply does not match it does not match the old school style and you know, that's all there is to it. So getting back to sort of like PT because you just want to draw into that because this is a really good question for you. You you basically brought PT into Australia you brought it from the US and then only gym sport twenty years now. Yeah. And you've seen a lot of PTs come and go. Have you noticed a difference in the quality of PTs in that 20 years since it's become cool to be a PT and have that, that role in that job? Probably the, the biggest difference that I've noticed in PTs is that everybody wants to sleep with personal trainers. I used to think that PT, doing PT, was, I, was not something that you know was so great. I didn't think you, you were a personality. Now, you know, Madonna got pregnant by her personal trainer. Personal trainers are almost like sex symbols. I don't know how to train you, but some of them aren't really good sex symbols from what I can see. Yeah. And it's, the, the whole thing to me just it, it's wacky. It's, it's just wacky. Yeah, I think it could improve it's better regulated. It's regulated now. How much more are you going to regulate it? I think it's the information that's been fed to people. It's what you've been taught. Um, you know, and like you said, it was more for insurance purposes and keeping it safe. 
before you came in here and took over the personal training, some of the stuff that I used to see, I, I simply would just have to look away. And, and then I would think to myself, okay, this guy's come into my place, he's doing this, how am I going to get rid of him? Yeah. <laughs> it was, it's all wrong. It's all yeah. wrong. Yeah. All right, we're going to get on to your questions now. So the first question we've got is probably the most interesting question of all. And that's basically people want to know who you actually look up to and who you first learned your training from. So where did you actually get a start in this? Where did you get your first knowledge base? Well, those magazines, for starters, um, I always looked to the elders of the sport. Uh, you know, always, always look for the older, best school guy in the gym. Uh, that was my philosophy. Just got a question there. You know, question them, find out where they learned it from, um, go back as far as you could, and you know, put it together in a manner where it all makes sense. Because you know, some of the some of their answers are, and, and the way they gave me the information was probably not uh, in the best professional sense. Mm -hmm. And you know, coming up through bodybuilding, I was particularly interested in the American bodybuilding scene. And you know, at 11 and 12 years of age, reading about the Colorado experiment, what Arthur Jones was doing with Casey Vieira, uh, these guys have both passed away. And, and Arthur Jones really was a pioneer of bodybuilding. Arthur, Arthur Jones was, in the was a pioneer, but I think Arthur Jones was a marketing genius. Yeah. You he know, had the one inch on your arm in yeah. a week and stuff like that. Which, which was all possible, I know how they did it. So there, there was that, and then you had you know, the golden era of bodybuilding which I think started probably in, in the 40s, and, and it actually ended just as I was coming into the sport, and it was practically gone by the late 80s and early 90s, it was over. You know, so then coming into the modern bodybuilding era of, of Arnold and Franco, and um, you know, it, it was very funny because when I met these people, they gave me a little bit of information, and it kind of like made my mind open up like a parachute. I remember visiting Franco Colombo in Los Angeles, uh, you know, in his chiropractic office. And, you know, the guy was just a storehouse of wealth. And not just the men, you know, there was, um, when Rachel McLeish came to Australia, she was probably a person who was involved very heavily in the Gold's gym scene with Arnold and Franco. And, you know, she had to try harder than these guys, because this, this was a woman, she was the first Miss Olympia, when she came to Australia, just some of the information that she passed on, you know, like, when did she come to Australia? Um, yeah. She came to Australia in the 80s. Yeah. So you would have been sort of, were you talking early 80s? I think it was mid 80s. Mid 80s, so you were you, you a pro by then. I was, I was already, already a pro. And, yeah. But I didn't know, I wasn't, I didn't actually know what went on in, in, in the Golds gym in that um, area, you know, with Joe Weir, Arnold, uh, that pack of people, you know, when Peter Kronkowski owned uh, Golds gym. Uh, Joe Gold, but I, I didn't actually know what was going on there because that was really a magical time mm. where, you know, a bodybuilding went from um, what was going on in, say, in the 40s, you know, on Muscle Beach, and, and then it all became a little bit more technical, um, still old school, uh, but, you know, the physiques changed, uh, supplements changed, and, you know, watching all this, I always keep going back to the basics because they still were the best. They still were the best. Yeah, yeah. So basically, yours got on the seventies to the I know you're teaching all these seventies CDs and the improvements on the national. Don't get me wrong. A lot of the modern stuff is is very very good. Uh, a combination of that, you know, contemporary training mixed with old school is is what I do. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'm never going to stop training. We'll get back to that later at the end of the interview. I've got another question for you on that. All right, our second question is from Andy Lamont. And Andy wants to know, what methods do John find most effective for dropping his fuel prior to a competition? So this is actually a big problem. You know, I often hear, you know, you, you drink still water, you don't drink water, you water low, you cut out salt, you cut out potassium. There's a thousand different ways to do this. What did you do? What was most effective? It's probably the most effective method for me was going to distilled water, which was probably not necessary, but I, you know, when I, when I wanted to get a job done, I would pull out all stops. So you had the distilled water, but then coming up to the show, 
you needed to understand that if you dropped salt too early, you were going to get an increase in aldosterone. Then you don't want that. So it was a matter of knowing when to cut out the salt. You know, some people start dieting and they cut out salt. That's a mistake. I used to cut it out just before the show, perhaps a day or two before. Okay? Because after about 72 hours of not having salt, your, your aldosterone levels start to increase. And then if you have the slightest thing that has a little bit of sodium in it, it could have a detrimental effect. Uh, the other method we used was possibly looking at in the mirror, looking at your physique in the mirror as you were zeroing in for the contest, and judging to see whether you needed to cut back on the water. I never believed in going uh, to zero water, that's ridiculous, but perhaps cutting back and seeing if, if the carbs that you were utilising, um, you know, could, could be utilised, carbs utilise water. So then you'd be looking and seeing, okay, I'm a little bit puffy, so instead of cutting out my carbs, I've still got to fill out. Let's see if I can have just enough carbohydrates to soak up the water that's in my body between the muscle and the skin. So would that mean you increase in carbohydrates at that point if you're a bit puffy? Um, no, it could mean you keep having your carbs, but yeah. possibly cut back on water. Just, yeah. But then if you didn't have enough water, the carbohydrates wouldn't fill the muscle. Yeah. And if, it was, if you're just carving up on carbs, that's not enough because I'll go straight through you. So you have to have a, a certain amount of protein and fat in there. So it becomes very complicated and, and you know, the parameters is probably what everybody should learn about, which, you know, we, we can go into detail possibly on the second part of this interview or, or even in, in the manuals that I'm going to start putting together. Um, you know, but then there's quick fixes. There's, there's things like having, say, two shots of vodka. Yeah, and Ali was famous for drinking so much Jim Beam, I think, before competition. Well, he, he was playing around with that backstage at the yeah. Astral League in 1980, but he was not in his best shape. Um, Mike Mensa used to have a couple of vodkas the night before. I also found that Elevating Your Legs, which was taught to me by um, Franco. Franco Rizzola was one of the people that um, trained me uh, in the late 80s, and he was a storehouse of information. This guy was a hothead from New Jersey. So yeah. He was an Italian maniac. Uh, but very, very smart uh, chiropractor. Him and, and um, Basile Chalet used to come to New York from New Jersey just to train me. And, um, you know, they showed me another side of training that uh, I'd never come across. Yeah. You know, and I've shown you some of this stuff and you don't even know it. No, no, yeah. It's, it's so, so, how much water would you have in sort of normal each day? How many, how many glasses? I would always have like 10 to 15 glasses. So about three or four hours. Well, yeah. 10 to 15, 8 ounce glasses of water, whatever that adds up to. And come in the competition, how much would you do that? Possibly none. So right. even after that, for the competition, well, drinking that much Yeah, I may, I may not restrict the water, but like I said, it was all to do with how you live in your own. Yeah. All right. Next question is from Ace Aesops. Uh, my question is, what's something that's helped you the most while prepping for this universe title? And is that what inspired you to design your own supplementary nutrition? By the way, it's the best tasting protein on the market. Thank you, Ace of these subs. Um, so I guess what we're getting at there is, you know, what subs did you use when you're going for the universe? More importantly, did you see the need to actually develop your own range because of the lack of good supplements out there? Absolutely, all of that. Um, you know, for me, the most stable supplement was always a good protein powder. Good protein powder. Um, you know, but back then, you would go to the health food store and you would buy all the separate things that you needed mm. and put them together. You know, like so you buy the ingredients yourself. I would buy the ingredients and, and mix them myself. So would you instance, actually break down and buy the aminos yourself and actually do the exact one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so for instance, now they'll have a sleep formula which is supposed to increase growth hormone output. So I would simply go and buy arginine and all four and mix them together. And um, it was my um, growth, hormone, growth hormone formula. How'd that work? Fantastic. If, if you did it on an empty stomach. And that information I got from um, Dirk Shaw and Sandy Pearson in a book called Life Extension, where these were just regular people who weren't even training. They were research scientists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they got amazing results uh, from using this sort of stuff. Yeah. So what, what substance did you use when you went up to the university? Did you protect that? Well, there was, always, there was also always a, a good multivitamin in the book, which is very important. A good protein powder, and then I would also be mixing my own pre workouts. So, were pre workouts around back then? No, there weren't any pre workouts, but you know, you could 
get. I remember getting these Chinese herbs that look like uh, dried up worms. Yeah. You know, and you, you would boil them and drink them. The, the things gave me so much energy at night time when I went to bed. I, I, I felt like standing in the bed. Yeah. I, I couldn't go to sleep. Um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and what about things for increased blood flow, better palm? Yeah. Well, a lot of the ingredients we've seen in, in pre work that's now are starting to go away from the energy more than actually you're getting blood into getting, getting the pump. So it was, um, I forgot the name of it, we're going to we may have to cut this. Um, Jingle Pumper. Yeah. Jingle Pumper. Okay, yeah. Jingle Pumper creates circulation. Nice, and if, if you take enough nice, and you will just you know, your body will just flush with blood. That will be the jingle or the bowl and will be a great pump. And now you're not going to get that great pump if you don't have enough carbohydrates in there to facilitate the pump. So it was a combination of that, which, which I would have and would have called a pre-workout. Yep. And now you've got things like juice, which has all of that in there. Yep. Uh, juice has also got a uh, growth hormone stimulator. Know, uh, something that increases your testosterone levels as well, gives you a great pump and gives you the focus. You know, we were using dangerous things like yeah, you know, lots of coffee. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how much sort of coffee would you be is the one oh, one right. or one? No, I'm talking like you'd have like two or three cups of coffee that you buy no dose, yeah, which is I don't know, maybe hundred or two hundred milligrams of uh, not too oh, I feel so getting in a lot of pre workouts yeah. so I think I've seen one pre workout three or three four hundred milligrams. Yeah, but that's also the one that's going to give you the biggest crush. Yeah, yeah, exactly. True. Excellent. All right, next question is from someone who wishes to remain anonymous. Um, I don't know why, they're absolutely fantastic questions. So how would you compare training in, in your era and today? And you've touched on this a little bit as well. Has it changed a lot? For me, it hasn't changed. Yeah. I'm still doing the things that I knew worked and gave me the best results. What I see today I mean, I, I, I did CrossFit when I didn't know how to train. Yeah. You know, I'd be running from one exercise to another, just trying to get breathless and, and work up a sweat. So, when were you doing this? When I first started training and I didn't know what to do. So, what, how old were you doing this? 11 or 12. Yeah. You've got to tell everyone the story of the coffee table. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the magazine and the Mendes Press is fantastic. The, um, one of the first magazines that I bought was Iron Man, and they had an article on. Um, on chest training, you know, and I'm reading this and I'm going bench press four times twelve. I'm going, okay, bench press. So this this either means you're you're either standing with a bench and pressing it, or you're laying on the floor and pressing it, and because that's the way it read. Like bench press. How do you do a bench press without having a photo and describing it? So it's just written out, no photo. No, there was no there was no photo in this particular article. So I, I remember laying on the ground and just bench pressing the, the coffee table. At, at um, my mum and dad's coffee table. Yeah, because... What did they think of that? Well, they, they, they just thought there's something wrong with this kid. You know? <laughs> and, and how many reps did you do? Well, I understood the four lots of 12. Yeah. But I actually, when I started training, did not do reps. So I used to train by time. So I thought if I could bench press the coffee table for a minute, that was fantastic. And I could bench press it for two minutes, that means I'm growing or getting stronger. Yep. Uh, I used to squat for minutes. You know, I, I just body weight. Well, no, I had a um, I had a steel pipe with bricks tied on the end. Yep. When I first started squatting, I could squat it for a minute. By the time I had worked up to five minutes of squatting, not only was I so much more physically fit, but my thighs were getting this huge pump and, and they were growing. What other exercises did you do? Because you're doing this in the living room with your parents. Now. Yes. How old are you? About 12 or 13? Uh, 12, 13, 14, yeah. Yeah. What made you start training at that age? Because it's pretty young to actually start training. Yeah. So. I, I happened to come across a photograph of Arnold Schwarzenegger on the cover of a magazine called Muscle Builder uh, in, um, in a town that my mother lived in, which was Cobra in Sydney, New South Wales. And I was shopping with my mother and I saw this magazine and I went, wow. You know, I was into athletics, shot putting, sprinting, and just it just dawned on me, yeah, why are you throwing a steel ball in a patch of grass? When this guy, look at this guy, he's holding that girl on the beach. Yeah. When you could look like this. How do you look like that? Was it the girl he was holding? Or it was just it was just 
Joe Weider was was a marketing genius. You know, I wanted to be a Weider wildcat. As soon as I saw that magazine, and I opened up and I saw that tiger jumping over the protein yeah. and arm um, holding that girl, I was hooked. That was it. That was it. Excellent. All right, next question is, how do you think we can make Aussie builders competitive against the rest of the world? So I guess what we're looking at there is, and I mean, one thing that I've seen too is, yeah, back in the 90s in Australia, we, you go to the photo show in the 90s in Australia, and every person on that stage was someone who could become a pro in America. It was incredible. Um, and it seems that it sort of dropped off a bit. It seems that Australia sort of dropped off a little bit. So, have you ever noticed that yourself? Or? I, I have. I, I think Australians have always suffered a little bit from uh, something that's called xenophobia. And, you know, they. They, 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 they stick within this country. For me, it was very difficult because to become the best bodybuilder in Australia was easier said than done. Um, and, you, and I knew I needed to do that before I could go over and tackle the big boys in the United States. Having said that, when I started training, I didn't know what was available in this country. So all I ever trained for was for Arnold, Sergio and Bill Pearl yeah. to be that good, that good, or to beat them. So I, I actually had no idea of what was going on. All I ever saw in the American bodybuilding magazines was two Australian bodybuilders. One of them was Robert Naylor, who used to write for Muscular Development, and the other one was Paul Graham, who was one of my great inspirations because he's a tall, wrong kid. This guy used to do a TV commercial for Finney Ford. So, you know, he'd walk into a car sales yard and he'd lift the back of the car and push it out. So I used to see this guy with his gigantic arms, his huge chest, and then I started seeing photos of him and Arnold together. Yeah. So I had to go immediately and, and, and meet this guy and train his student. And, and what did Paul say? What was like the first time meeting Paul Graham and what other side of the train? The, the first time I met Paul, um, he, he was nice. He was very nice. He, he saw that I was just a young kid, you know, 13 or 14, and I visited his gym. And there was a guy in there by the name of Harry Eden who was a football player for South Sydney. And he said to me, you know, if you're serious, you'll start training here because I was actually still training at home. And, and I remember lifting the coffee table. Lifting, well, no, by this stage, I, I, I knew how to do a bench press. I knew how to do a bench press. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, Harry said to me, if, if you're serious, you'll start training here. And he called me a fat boy. I remember walking down the stairs of the gym and I said, I'm going to show you. Yeah. You know, I'm going to compete in this contest and I'm going to win this type. I had no idea what I was talking about. I just, I had to say it to him. And um, he, he really pushed the right buttons, yeah. Harry. And, um, you know, later I did win that title. And Paul and that was the police boys club title your first one, wasn't it? My first title, my, sorry, my first contest that I entered, I got second place. It was the. Um, Police Citizens Youth Club Championships for Sydney, and I, and I got second place. I, I dieted for another six weeks, and what was underneath that happened to be quite good, and um, I showed up at the state titles. I beat the guy that beat me at the police one, police yeah. one. and um, I, I won the uh, junior division, and unbeknownst to me, I, I had also won the men's open division, so to this day I hold the record for being the youngest ever person to win uh, the That's overall right. and, and uh, open state championships in Mr. New South Wales. How old were you? Oh, 17. 17. Yeah, 17. Yeah. 17. Excellent. Um, right, our next question is um, about judges actually. So do you think that one of the prerequisites of being judged is that they should have competed themselves? Yeah, I do believe that Earl Fox he was a very good bodybuilder, said he couldn't handle standing on stage and looking at these little guys in blue suits, you know, telling him what to do on stage. And I couldn't agree more. Unless you've eaten tuna out of the can and you've stepped on that stage and you've trained and you've gone the whole nine yards, you shouldn't be sitting on a judging panel. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy about Bertle Fox and his placing, so that is incredible out there. Bertle Fox and his placings were, were what they were because the crowd would always fall in love with him because, you know, Bertle used to fire off like 30 most muscular poses. And I don't think anybody looks better than Bertle Fox in most muscular, muscular poses. Yeah. And um, once he won, once fans saw that, he'd won him over, they'd fall in love with him and 
anything other than first place was, up to, was just unacceptable. But, but you know, things like when he competed against Sami Abamud at the Mr. Olympia, yeah, he may have had a, a better, most muscular than Samir, but that quickly changed once he turned to the back. Yeah, Samir turned around the back. Samir so, so had a superior back with a superior back detail. His legs looked better from the back. Um, he was the first one to really bring Christmas straight out of the stage. Samir was the first person who actually brought that yeah. to the stage and, and the conditioning, you know. So, yeah, Bertel looked great in, you know, with a thick chest and all that. But when you judge him against a much smaller adversary like Samir, you know, they both had good shoulders, they both had good arms, good abdominals. You know, Samir's legs from the front were aesthetic, but Bertel didn't really know how to, how to pose them. You know, Samir had the aesthetics, Bertel had this brutal mass, Samir had better conditioning, um, superior body parts, and you know, at the 1983 Mr. Olympia, they were booing when Bertel placed, Bertel placed fifth. fifth, fifth but, but the fact was, if they, had, if they had seen the whole of the judging from beginning to end, they would have realised that, that, that Samir was just like so far ahead of him, it wasn't even funny. And Samir had a lot of problems with conditioning too. He's so always had Samir a problem with that conditioning. did have problems with his conditioning, you know, whether it was uh, whatever it was. That, caused him to possibly come in a little bit heavier or hold water. But when he nailed it, he, you know, that was it. He would have everything that you would want, the conditioning, the shape, the size, yeah, very good body and, and nice person. Okay, the next question is probably a, a, an interesting one, especially for people sort of getting into body work like that. So at what age did you start using anabolic steroids and why did you feel the need or want to do so? So this is, this is a big one at the moment. There's a lot of kids out there that are really using anabolic steroids. The age of 17, 18, they come up to me. Um, and their quantities are using it astronomical. We're talking you know, 10 mil. You know, we're talking ridiculous amounts. So I, I, I guess for you personally, but also maybe comment too on just what sort of quantities were these pros using back when you were coming through? Even when I was coming through, there was a lot of steroid abuse and people were taking large dosages. I can only tell you what I took. And when I won my, Mr. my first Mr. Universe title, uh, I, I, did, I used, I, I took my first anabolic steroid in the 12th of April, 1982, I was 23 years of age. And um, I had already competed in Mr. Universe and placed and, and I could tell that there was something that these guys were doing that I wasn't doing. And, um, you know, when I started using them, it's, it's pretty much what girls use today. It would have been something like uh, exactly 17 and a half milligrams of Anabar a day, as it's known as Anabar or Anabar. Um, two shots, 50 milligrams each of Uravon, and the last two weeks before the contest, I added in 25 milligrams of testosterone propionate with each of the shots of Durablin, and that was it. That was it. And how long was that for the That was uh, eight weeks before the contest. And did that give you the edge that you, you, you knew that was lacking? Did that actually fill in that gap for Good question. It, it helped me hold on to the mass yeah. that I built in the off season. So realistically, you were using one of the main types of hormones that as you were hold on. Sure. It wasn't actually, I'm using this to get big. Well, look, you know, steroids can get you big. The fact is, um, I've, I've used anabolic steroids to try to put on size. And what works better for me is being able to be what I want, the, the amounts that I want, getting the right amount of sleep, basic training, that actually works better than actually using anabolic steroids for well, You know, for, for me, things like, for instance, raw milk that hasn't been touched straight out of the cow, two large glasses of that a day, I feel give me the same nitrogen retention as 10 milligrams of dianabol. Yeah. That's interesting. And, and again, getting back to that question is, did you have full pressure at the time? Or was yes. It you made yourself full pressure? Yeah, I did full pressure. So it's actually that level I wanted a level competition uh, 
a stage. And I would do whatever it took to get that. Yeah. Fair enough too. Um, we've got another question by Eddie Mallard, and he wants to know how did you train for the universe? And he's just made a note here. Did you prefer hit training or rocking training? What was the actual training style that you had? I did both. Yep. Uh, I started off with body, and the reason why I started off with body because it was the amount of the sheer amount of body that I was doing uh, helped burn calories and get me to a stage where I was body fat free. Then I simply increased my food, decreased my training to more of the HIT type of training. Uh, started doing some cardio and that helped me put on like 30 pounds of muscle leading up to the contest. So instead of dieting down and starving, I was actually I actually built up. So you'd actually diet first, get rid of the body fat and then that particular time that's how I did it. Yeah. And is that sort of did you do that for most of your competitions? No, I, I did that for a couple of the competitions and when I did do that that's probably the the times that I did come in the biggest. Yeah. on stage which not many people saw because it was my last contest, that was one of the contests that I did in. What was the biggest you went on stage? Probably when I won the Pro Universe, which was 230 pounds, 2.5 percent body fat. And you know what, during the 80s, during like, when you were coming out, I know at the Olympia, I think you were over one or two or something. At the Olympia, most of the shows where people saw me compete for the IFBB, they were never playing. It was like, you know, I was living in Australia, training at Paul Graham's gym, Paul would get a call from Wayne Dominga saying, you know that guy that came over for the night of champions, we want him over here, get him over. And Paul walking into me goes, we'll start training for the contest. And I'm in the middle of pigging out, like, I don't yeah. like my food, what, what are you talking about? He goes, you need to train for the contest. And it was never planned, so it was always this rush, and all I ever did when I was in, in the IFBB is, all they've ever seen is me around, I don't know, 95 kilos, 205, 210 pounds. It was a rush job. When I had a chance to do it my way, 